Right, well, I hope you're all having an amazing day today. I, for one, surely am as well. I've uh, seen some absolutely wonderful exhibitions over here. There's been some fantastic talks and still more to come. My name is Catherine Ergang. I'm a TV presenter for Islam Channel TV and also a freelance writer. And, of course, here to introduce our next wonderful guest. Now, the weather outside might be giving you dodgy knees because it's a bit damp out there. It's that time of year where you might need a vitamin infusion. But today, Dr. Zalan Allen has swiveled his GP's chair right around to talk to us about those who ruled an empire, which at one point were the world's largest, with an economy worth over 25% of the world GDP and ruling all over the Indian subcontinent. Dr. Zalan Allen is an intermediate care champion whose work has been helping local GPs manage medical complexity at home. As a clinical lead for intermediate care services at GP Care and NHS Haywood, Middleton and Rochdale CCG, Dr. Allen led on a project as part of a wider collaboration to help the frail elderly live at home. So here to tell us more about the mighty Mughal emperors of India, Truths and legends, I introduce you, Dr. Zalan Alam. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. I hope you've all been enjoying the event today. Um, is that okay? Yeah. So, a quick introduction about myself uh, beyond what Catherine said. So, as you might have guessed, I'm not uh, a historian by academic trade. I'm uh, a, a GP, a doctor by background, uh, with an interest in history uh, that goes back uh, many, many years. And my interest was sort of particularly around the South Asian uh, era, history and Islamic history in particular. Um, and I've always been conscious of the fact that I'm not an academic as such, so when, if you ask me about specifics, about dates, about um, intricate details about what, was, what people were doing in particular times, I'm probably not the best person to ask. But what I do do it from my point of view uh, is to look at things from a more of a story-based, a narrative-based look at history. And for me, stories are really important. They, they tell us about not just the fact that bad things are there in the world, but also that there are good things in the world. It also reminds us about things like adversity, compassion, uh, on all those various things, and they uh, help give us, help us make sense of the world as it is. And here I had a particular problem when it came to the Mughals. The, the, the great Mughals, as they ca are called, whether you talk about Babur or all the way to Aurangzeb Alamgir, uh, I used to struggle with one simple thing, and that was how to remember which one was which. I mean, yes, I could remember dates, I could remember particular times, but what made that person unique? And what could make me understand them better? And with time, how, the way I sort of understood it was as a series of stories, the st a stories about a human character and human endurance. Now, stories and fables are just that. They are stories and fables. Some perhaps have a higher degree of authenticity and validity than others. But they're always checked by the fact that we can never be 100% sure. So you have to remember that when you look at history, you're looking at these fables in the terms of what they mean to us in this moment in time. So we will always be projecting our ideas of history and our ideas of the modern day onto those things. And with that, I'd like to start with a very simple fable. So, if you go there. I'd like to start with a, a really old story uh, which is actu actually has nothing to do with the Mughals. And that is the story of the camel in the tent. Now, for those of you who are not really aware of the, the story of the camel in the tent, the story goes that there was a man in a tent one day, 
and it was a freezing cold night in the desert. And he saw this camel, his, his camel, uh, sort of push his head through the tent entrance and have a quick look inside. And he could tell the camel was feeling really cold. And perhaps out of kindness or perhaps because he was tired, he allowed the camel to put it, leave its head inside the tent. And then gradually, after a bit, the camel started to put in, uh, move itself a little bit deeper into the tent. And once again, the man, out of tiredness or compassion or kindness or convenience, allowed it to gradually inch its way deeper into the tent. And by the end of the night, the man was outside the tent and the camel was inside it. And so goes the saying about, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And I want you to remember that little story when we talk about the history of the subcontinent. And the second little story I would like you to think about is whenever we talk about things like armies uh, in, the, in that era, you ha we're not talking about modern day armies in the modern sense. These are not armies which have a, a sense of professional, regular things, but most importantly what they don't have is they don't have, more often than not, a regular monthly salary being given to the soldiers. If anything, these armies are given money or paid, these soldiers are paid at the end of a campaign of war. So everything depends on success in the war, but more importantly, on the survival of their leader. So the moment the leader is, if he was killed or, or captured, in more cases than not, the battle was over. So I want you to remember those two little things, if that's okay. And with that, we go on to a quick idea of what the Mughal Empire was. Um, this is a really good map, which I, I found uh, after a bit of research. And it gives you an idea of what the Mughal Empire first started off, as you can see in the area, which is slightly purple shaded, and then how it expanded. And then all those colored areas are actually the Mughal Empire at its height. Now, at its height, by the year 1700, this was probably the greatest, richest economy in the world. Uh, the Mughal Empire emperor at the time was unmatched in power, wealth. Uh, he, he commanded an army which geographically might not have been as big as uh, rivals like the Ottomans or the Safavids, but in terms of population and in terms of wealth, dwarfed anything they'd ever seen. It was, uh, it was a formidable empire. It was one that when traders would arrive, I mean, the question that would arise to them would be that, well, what could they offer to the great Mughal kings that they did not already have? And this was something that many traders struggled with for many, many years to solve, because if anything, all they could do was buy from the, the, the Mughal empire. They had very little to sell to them. And here we begin with the, what the, the man who created the modern Mughal empire, the, what we consider the, the, great, the first great Mughal, and that is, Babur, and he begins Babur, and, and we say this with a lot of confidence because this is his own writing. Uh, he writes in the month of Ramadan of the year for June 1494, and at, at 12 years old, I became the ruler of the country of Fergana. And we say this because unlike most rulers of the time, Babur wrote an incredibly vivid account of his life in a book called the Babur Nama. Babur himself was a man who descended from two bloodlines that were historically had great ties to world conquest or regional conquest. And that was the, the Tamarid line of Tamerlane, the Prince of Terror, a man of incredible brutality and incredible genius who the likes of which the world had only last seen maybe 200 years prior. And the second was uh, a descendant from the, the great Genghis Khan or Chenghis Khan, the great Mongol, the, the great Mongol Empire, em, emperor, the man whose empire would stretch all the way from modern day Russia, China, to the borders with Vietnam, to all near the edges of Central Europe. And these were the two bloodlines that, that he saw himself being an inheritor of.
What Babur really was, as far as stories will go, is, and if you were to read the Babur Nama, is a man who was a firm believer or a man who lived his life by the concept of try, try again. This was a man that despite the, his uh, upbringing, despite his knowledge and education, he lost countless battles. At a young age, he essentially lost the kingdom which he ruled, um, all for the quest of his neighboring kingdoms. He was often betrayed by his uncles and his relatives uh, at a very young age. And ultimately, by the year 1500, he, he was basically homeless. He was pen nearly penniless and nearly destitute. And as luck would have it, he gambled everything on a move towards Kabul in modern day Afghanistan. And that move was, uh, by sheer luck and bravery, he managed to capture Kabul from one of his relatives. And that would be the beginning of the first steps of, his, uh, of the eventual Mughal Empire. Now, after several tries, and, after, and he, was, he didn't really have much headway in anything. He managed to get some success in Afghanistan, but his real dream was to eventually re return to his home kingdom in Central Asia. He was essentially an exile. He was an exile from a land that he dreamed of, and he had very little way of getting back. But then something happened. He was invited to conquer India. And like the camel, he just put his head a little bit into the tent, invited by rivals of the ruler, the, the Sultan of Delhi. And with that, he invaded India and, uh, and defeated the rulers. And the people who invited him in are lost to history after that. No sooner than that had happened, he did not actually have any such strong association with the region. And when he writes about India, he actually writes about it quite almost disparagingly in his memoirs. He writes, uh, the towns and the countryside of Hindustan are greatly wanting in charm. Its towns and lands are all of one sort. There are no w walls to the orchards and most of the places are on the dead level plain. He, he mocks the place, he mocks the people, he, mo he hates the weather. Uh, like so many people, he hates the weather. The man from the Central Asian steppes, he couldn't, st he couldn't stand the heat of the Indian subcontinent. But he loved the wealth, the warmth that it provided him. And with that, one day, not long after he had conquered uh, the, the, the Sultanate of Delhi, he, his, f his favorite son became ill. His son, known as Hamayun, suddenly contracted an illness that we were not sure of what was, but we do know that Babur was grief-stricken by this, this news. And what he, all he could do was he would pray uh, and, and s sort of make a circuit around Hamayun's bed and, and pray to God and pray to the Almighty and say that, O oh God, take my life but spare my sons. And suddenly out of nowhere, Hamayun's fever and his illness broke, and he made a remarkable recovery. And not long after that, Babur passed away. And so ends the story of the first great Mughal. Can we go to the next one? And so begins the story of Hamayun. Hamayun, on, on Babur's death, bed, Hamayun was given um, some words of advice from his father. And he said that, perhaps speaking from his own personal experience, that no matter what happens, my son, you must show kindness to your brothers and your step your stepbrothers. And do not ever always forgive them do, and never show them any ill will. And Hamayun took those words to heart. It was perhaps a, ref a reflection of a man whose kindness was in incredible, but also was 
incredibly unlucky and a very poor judge of character. Hamayun did exactly what his father said, and at every step of the way, he was let down by his, his siblings. So much so that one day after a great battle against one of his rivals, his army was defeated completely. He had lost everything. And here was, he was literally drowning in a river when a, a, water merge, a water carrier basically rescued him. This poor man, with no real wealth of any kind, showed a great deal of kindness to, that, to, to Hamayun. And Hamayun never forgot it. And he said to the man that, you have shown me more kindness than all my siblings and all my trusted advisors. And when I return to the, to the capital, I will make you king for the day as a thank you. Because I, in a way, he was giving what everybody else wanted from him. He, and he was giving it willingly. And he kept his word. He returned to the capital with his poor water carrier and made him king and granted his every wish for a short time. And so it was with that, Hamayun again trusted his brothers and again started to lose. And eventually, his kingdom would fall to uh, another outsider, a man called the Sher Shah Suri. The Sher Shah was, was a brilliant king whose stories for another time. But Hamayun essentially lost his kingdom and had to escape all the way to modern day Iran. He, he was in exile again, like his father to some extent. The unlucky man was for once though fortunate. He, he had trusted the, the ruler of Iran, of, of Persia, and the Persian king honored him with that. And when the time came with the, after the death of Sher Shah, Hamayun eventually managed to return to India in, as a, and defeat his rivals there and become king again. But remember how I said what an unlucky man Sher Shah was. One day after having recaptured his father's kingdom, Sher Shah got up, walked down the stairs from the library and tripped, fell and died instantly. One historian would write that Hamayun entered, left the world as he entered it, just almost by accident. And with that began the story of the man who is considered by many Western writers at the time, the greatest of all of the kings of the world, Akbar the Great. Now, one forward. Yeah. So Akbar the, Akbar the Great uh, was the was Hamayun's son, and as his son, he was actually an interesting character for the most. He was, for most of his childhood, um, uh, for most of his childhood, he would he would str he would struggle with two things. One was, he was a man who was illiterate. He had been brought up by by his relatives, while his father was in exile. He had barely had any contact with him. He couldn't read. And some say that actually he may have had some uh, dyslexia even. But now, Akbar the Great, as he's called, had a curious thing in him. He was a, a man who was incredibly curious. He was curious about the world. He was curious about religion. He was curious about everything. And he's often celebrated as a symbol of tolerance and everything, and, and, many, uh, and a man of great wealth. And the reason for that is fairly simple. He's, they think of it like that because he was also the first person that uh, Western tradespeople came in contact with after the discovery of the New World. So the, the first contact with the Portuguese. So he was their real, he was the big main contact. And he was the man whose, whose time as king was so long that He's attributed with bringing a lot, incredible amount of wealth and development to uh, India. But to give you an idea of how his curiosity could take him into strange places, there is the story of Akbar where Akbar was asked a question, or allegedly uh, they say asked a question, uh, and that question was, where did language come from? 
So language, it was believed, was something that was primordial to the human nature, meaning that we taught language and the language we speak was superimposed on a central core language. And Akbar wasn't sure about that, so his solution to this was to collect some people together, some, children, some babies, and to have them raised by someone who was mute. Lock them away for years, essentially with no contact to, the human, to anyone else, to any other human being, except this one person. And then finally he would send somebody back in to find and inquire about them and said, well these people could not speak any language which was not technically correct because they actually spoke in sign. But it's one of those great language experiments of that time, which if you look at it was actually quite bizarrely, actually quite a cruel thing to do as well. But Akbar's curiosity had this problem that it knew no bounds. And this would eventually create a lot of friction between him and, his, and the more conservative elements within his court and ultimately with his son. At the end of his life, his son would rebel, and eventually, though, Akbar made peace with him. And that son uh, would be the next mo great Mughal king. We can, uh, the other way. One more, and one more. Yeah. Okay. So. Here begins also one of the most fascinating women of the time of the great Mughals. This picture, as you can see, is, is a picture of Nur Jahan. And for all intents and purposes, Nur Jahan was the empress of, of India. Now that picture, you might think, is not looking particularly courtly, ladylike, or whatever else. But what Nur Jahan is doing there is she's loading a gun. She was an avid hunter. And as you can look, if, if you look at it closely, you can see the almost a stern look at her on, at her, on her face. But the story of Nur Jahan is one of the great uh, romances of the Mughal history. And, and the story goes that one day, uh, ja, the, the, em, the emperor to be, as a young man, was an avid collector of pigeons. And one day uh, he returned and he had asked people to look after his pigeons that were all caged away. And he, on his return, he noticed they were all gone. All the cages had been opened, and they'd all been released. And the only person there was a young girl who was holding a pigeon in her hand. And she would say to him, so he, as he came in, and he, he, would, he, would, he was furious, and he would say, what happened to my, to my pigeons? And, they would, and she said that they've gone, they've flown away. And he, and he looked at her, and he said, how? And with that, she l opened her hand and said, like this. And she allowed the last one to fly away. And from that moment on, the man known as Jahangir, the, third great Mo uh, the fourth great Mughal king, would be completely enamored by this woman that he would eventually marry. Jahangir meaning conqueror of the world. And the conqueror of the world would therefore name his wife something simple as well. So he, her name was Nur Jahan, the light of the world. The conqueror had married the light of the world. And it was an event that would be transformative at the time for India because you had a woman in, with incredible amounts of power. She was articulate, she was courageous, she was well-read, she brought a level of sophistication to the culture of the court which had never been seen before. And to, but to give you an idea of Nur Jahan's uh, most amazing little side story to this was something which, if you were to hear it from uh, anyone else, you would consider it a story for a movie. So the story goes that John Gere was one day captured by one of his generals and imprisoned. And worried about the love of her life, she basically rallied a quick army and tried to release him. Nur Jahan leading at the t an army at the time was something unheard of. But she was unsuccessful, and she couldn't manage to free him. So rather than be separated from him, she actually surrendered herself to the general's uh, care so she could be close to him.
And to take things to the next uh, level, once the general had left the, the fort where they were imprisoned, she managed to convince all his soldiers to switch to her side. And then she freed herself, freed her husband, and chased the general away and restored themselves to the throne. And, and so at that point, their love was something which also created an immense amount of rivalry and also sort of dissent from others. But its love knew no new bounds, no new bounds for the empress, and so much so, whenever the orders were given for anything by the emperor, he would often say in her name and in his name. And she's a sadly a forgotten character now in, in modern day retellings of history, but she's also uh, an incredibly interesting character, and I think uh, deserves a lot more attention when we talk about it. Next one. Can you go? Uh, so the other one was. Just one back. Okay, I'll come back to this one. So I'll, I'll ignore the picture for a second, but I'd like to tell you one other story, and that would be about Jahangir's son. So the conqueror of the world's son could have no less a title. His son was known as Shah Jahan, the ruler of the world. And Shah Jahan, unlike all the others, had a particular weakness. Shah Jahan's love for his eldest son, Dara Shikoh, was knew no bounds. He loved his eldest son, but equally, he hated his other son. His other son, known as Aurangzeb. And Shah Jahan wanted whatever he could do to make sure that his son, Dara Chikko, would become the next king after him. So what he did was, in his love, kept Dara Chikko close to him and pushed Aurangzeb further away. Aurangzeb would spend very little time at the course of Delhi because of Shah Jahan's distrust for him. But Shah Jahan was also quite a superstitious person. So the story goes that Shah Jahan one day asked one of his generals who he felt had the power of foresight and asked him that what, who will be the next king of India? Who will be the next great emperor? The general did not want to offend his, his, his boss and he said that your, your son, Dara Shikha, will be the next emperor as long as he keeps a very key financial advisor close to him in court. So with that, Shah Jahan was terrified. And he said, oh, I will keep this man close to me. I'll, I'll keep him close to my son. So unfortunately for him, the Aurangzeb one day came back from his many campaigns further outside of Delhi. And he would say that I need someone as a financial advisor to help me with my accounts for the battles I'm waging. And that general wanted to help Aurangzeb. So, but he needed that man back who was, who was, who was staying with Dara Shikho. So sh the way they did it was a matter of deception. Shah Jahan had a love of music. And one day, one of the musicians who was paid a handsome amount waited for the right opportune moment for the musician to be to, uh, uh, singing in a way that Shah Jahan was completely in his thrall. And at that moment, the general sneaked a little bit of paper in front of Shah Jahan to sign. And, and without looking, the emperor signed it, transferring over that financial advisor's posting to Aurangzeb. And so it was some years later, when Shah Jahan was close to the end of his life, there was a rebellion. And sure enough, it would be that Aurangzeb won that battle of succession and became the last great Mughal. We have the next and one more. So we come to the last great Mughal, Aurangzeb Alamgir, the emperor of the world, of the universe, sorry. The emperor of the universe, Aurangzeb, lived his entire life worried about two things. One was that his sons would turn on him, perhaps like he turned on his father. And the other was to expand his empire to, uh, to the levels that nobody had ever seen. And with that, he took on a man called, he, in a way you would say, he created a man who would be his greatest rival, and that would be the great Maratha ruler, Shivaji. And Shivaji was the exact opposite of Aurangzeb, whereas Aurangzeb would do things through uh, sheer size and power of the empire, 
Shivaji basically created an army that could defeat the Mughals by not winning a battle against them. For every battle that Aurangzeb fought, Shivaji would retreat at the last moment and then recapture that territory. And Aurangzeb would spend his entire life waging war against, to, to keep his empire intact. Now, he's going through a period of uh, historical writers now look at Aurangzeb and there's a lot of uh, rediscovery and perhaps a readjustment of how negative some accounts of him are. But I think one thing really st stuck out to me was this last, one of his last letters uh, where he writes towards the end of his life to his son about the fleeting nature of this existence and life. And it's a very sad read, but it's also a beautiful read about um, life and death and also how fleeting power is. So with that, at that point in his life, even though his empire was the wealthiest, the most powerful in all cases, you know, in that, uh, uh, the largest territory the, emperor had ever, the empire had ever seen, Aurangzeb died a sad and almost bitter life. At the end. It was a bitter man. He had won every battle. He had defeated all enemies, but he had no peace. And with that, we come to the end of the tale of the great Mughals. Um, I just wanted to also reference uh, some great readings as well about the Mughals. The Babur Nama is, is available for purchase. There's some great re re accounts of Babur's life. The ba and if nothing else, I hope that today has encouraged you all perhaps to get a bit more insight into the Mughals, but also maybe make you want to read up a bit more about each of those characters. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for listening. And um, I'm just, I'll be here now to take some questions and answers. Thank you very much to Dr. Zalan, here we go, <laughs> Dr. Zalan Alam. Um, absolutely amazing, interesting stories there. And like he said, I think we've all remembered just a little bit more now about the Mughal emperors and, of course, have actually been able to place them now in history. Alhamdulillah, I've learned so much, so thank you so much. Uh, has anybody else got a question? I know there was a lady, um, or sorry, and there was a man at the back in the blue, in the blue top, yes? Um, did you want me to come over with the microphone? That I might be that better. Be because if I can... Come over. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Zalan. Yeah. Nice to see you nice again. See it's you. been a while. Yeah. Yes, the last time we saw each other, it was like some third rate radio studio in Rochdale. But <laughs> anyway, this is a much better setting for you, I think. Um, my question relates to the legacy of the Mughals in India today. Obviously, he says India as a society is a, it's in a state of some flux at the moment. Um, so what, how do um, uh, contemporary Indians view the Mughal legacy? How does that fit into the, the sort of like the rich and long history of India? Um, so yes, that, that's the question. Jazakallah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. I think, uh, I think my view of this is that, uh, to quote one of the great historians, uh, all history is contemporary history. And we often project our, uh, how we see things into we'll often find facts to fit our worldview. The reality is for that time, there was a far more uh, fusion of cultures and a far more diversity in how they looked at things uh, than there is today. Concepts of identity, whether you call someone a Hindu or if you call them a, a, a certain ethnic group or something like that, were not so well defined, or you, well, even in terms of Muslim identity, in terms of how uh, how much of a fusion there had been on places, whether you talk about the Malabar coast or whether you talk about Babur having fought mostly in the, in the initial phase of his life, mostly Muslims. Uh, the way the modern take on it seems to be that it creates a sense of us versus them. They are a collective. But the reality was not like that. Uh, Akbar's era, for example, was uh, had an incredible number of Rajput uh, senior the non-Muslim leaders were part of that bureaucracy. Uh, they're often they were intermarried very closely with them. Uh, and 
they had a sense of loyalty towards that area and land, which contrasts really with the way, the way things turned out later on in the 19th century, for example. And uh, I mean, to stretch the analogy of the camel uh, in the tent, 50 years after Aurangzeb's death, um, a particularly large camel went in and took over that tent, and that was to change India's future in a way that was very negative. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Um, you also just mentioned there about sort of Jiran Akbar the Great's um, reign, um, that there was intermarriage, but he was the first person to have contact with the Western world, the Portuguese. On a large in, scale. On a large scale th at that time. Um, did this start to change things? Did they start to spread out and, and marry sort of outside of their, their own empires at this stage? Did, was it all change? Not really. You ha I think the, the thing you have to remember that Again, it comes back to the, the sense of well, what can you offer us? And for, for the era of Akbar and all the way up towards Aurangzeb, there was very little that traders from the West could offer the Mughal at court mm -hmm. that, uh, in terms of whether the level of royalty or whatever else, the nobility and the sense of grandeur. So they were not overly impressed. Akbar was an exception in the sense that Akbar allowed unprecedented access to missionary work and um, sort of from a religious point of view, into the court. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, in terms of marriage, yes. If you look at, particularly if you look at uh, the, a book called The White Mughals by William Dalrymple, he writes an extraordinary account of many people from the West who settled in India, intermarried there, uh, became people of fairly high privilege and status there as well. And it's an extraordinary account. Some of the stories are uh, just, uh, just amazing reads, and I'd highly recommend it. If you're interested in finding about what was their contact, first contact like with the Mughal Empire. Mm. I mean, the fact that Akbar the Great was illiterate, yet had such a fascination with language. So did one sort of, you know, encourage the other? So obviously the fact that he couldn't get a grasp on reading language and, and, and knowing more about it. Did that sort of, do you think, did that sort possible. of increase I mean, his knowledge on sort of wanting to know so much more? We can, we can talk in hypotheticals, obviously. It's, po it's entirely possible. One, one of the things that he did, and I, I'm looking at those lovely portraits over there, uh, the way he tried to remember who his governors and, and other le key leaders were was he demanded that they make portraits for each one of them so he would know them by face because of his because of language issues. Yeah. Uh, it created a real sense of understanding of art as well in that. Uh, whether it influenced that decision about the curiosity about language, mm. it's entirely possible. Yeah, but it's truly amazing, isn't it? That he was seeing so much in the faces that, you know, he was learning so much just from these, well, artwork, yeah. you know, and faces in general. And does anybody else have any more questions? I think there were a few more hands up I did see over here or over here. Um, yep, I think we have brother over here. Okay. I'll, I'll pass you the microphone, it's just easier. and thanks so much for your talk. Um, just the final um, part of your talk uh, about uh, Aurangzeb. I don't understand how he lost his empire and how he took his eye off the ball and how he had so much mistrust with his sons that he couldn't uh, um, arrange uh, a successor after he died. What, what kind of happened there? I was a little, I mean, thank you for that question. I was a little limited by time of, uh, to go, uh, to, and that sort of stopped me from going into too much detail. But what Aurangzeb did was he basically imprisoned his father. So his father, Shah Jahan, uh, became unwell one day, and news spread really quickly that, sh that Shah Jahan had died. So each of the sons started to take, stake a claim. And Aurangzeb was uh, the, one of the first people to, to make a push to take over. And what he did then was he uh, defeated his brothers, eventually executed uh, Dar Shikho, and imprisoned his father. And for the rest of his li father's life, there was an exchange of letters of his, uh, between him and his father about how he had essentially become the first emperor uh, who while his father was alive. And perhaps that made him very suspicious of his sons because he went out of his way to make sure his sons were never given any senior appointments 
uh, he also did not out retire from the throne until very late in his life, at which point his sons had no experience in government and had no essentially real command of, over the system of government or the bureaucracy or the army. Um, it was, I mean, you can, argue that you can argue the toss about this because a lot of people will say that the end of the, or of the Mughal Empire didn't happen with the death of Aurangzeb. It's often used as a, a reference point for people. But it would be at least three decades later before the empire would really show signs of starting to disintegrate. So it's more of a mental point that where, where do you want to say that, there, that we're, this is the end of the great Mughals? Why, when, when can you say that this has come to the end? And you just sort of, I think that sounds right sort of approach. And that goes to many things, whether you talk about the decline of the Ottoman Empire, the Battle of Lepanto is often cited, many things. If you want to talk about the end of the British Empire, you could talk whether it was Suez or was it, uh, was it Dunkirk or various points. Often these are sort of created by linking them to personalities. And Aurangzeb fairly or unfairly gets a lot of the blame for being, the, because he was the last great ruler. Um, and that's for you to decide whether that's fair or not. I wouldn't want to put my spin on that. I mean, that that's interesting what you're saying about that link between distrust and power. And it's almost with great power is that uh, the passing on of great power, which then leads to distrust. And ultimately, it seems to be in many cases the downfall and the result of a huge success. Is this just the same story that happens to all empires across the world throughout history? I mean, whenever we talk about history, people will often say if people who don't learn from it will are condemned to repeat it. Uh, but I much prefer the saying that history doesn't repeat as much as it rhymes. And these are common sort of rhyming themes about history and human beings. Uh, every one of us tends to think we're the first ones to discover betrayal, tends to be the first one to discover power, uh, love, and all those other things. And ultimately, we make th those similar mistakes because we also believe we're the, we're, we can learn nothing from the past at all. Thank you, Anal. I, I guess that's just a great place to end this talk today. Thank you so much, Dr. Zalan Alam. And thank you all for listening to this wonderful speaker today. And I shall certainly want to be knowing more in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.